So anyway, a virtual welcome to Kevin Johnson, All right. who's, um, who's going to be presenting on behalf of RSG with, uh, about his experience with big data um, and its application in travel modeling. And, um, oh, I do have a poll actually for attendees. So let me start that now, quick poll to see who's represented here. And I'm gonna launch that. So it's just a couple quick questions to see um, who's joining us today and um, what travel model tools are you most interested in terms of the big data context? I should have said that, but um, so please fill that out. And I think you can just do that in the background. Um, and then I guess um, we can move on. Uh, the structure of this is gonna be that um, Kevin will present first. Um, and then we have a couple of folks from um, uh, MAG that'll be presenting second. And we're gonna aim for uh, around um, 15 minutes each. So 30 minutes of presentation, and then we'll go into Q&A. Um, and folks can ask questions in the Q&A, I believe at, at any point. So if you have a question that occurs to you, please feel free to put it in the Q&A in the chat. And then um, we'll discuss those at the open discussion part in the second half of the meeting. So take it away, Kevin. And thank you very much for joining us. And thanks for doing this on behalf of the, the Zephyr board. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you so much for inviting me, Lisa. I'm really happy to be here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, share my screen real quick. And let's make sure this works. All right. Okay, and let me just minimize that. Okay, uh, Lisa, can you see my screen? Absolutely, yes. All Looks right, good. thanks a lot. Yeah, so uh, once again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, today I'm gonna be discussing uh, basically my history of the use challenges and value uh, in my work with big data. And I'm gonna link that to travel models. Uh, I've actually used big data for uh, helping with you know policy questions and planning studies as well. So feel free to ask questions along those lines if you have them. But as I mentioned today, I'm primarily gonna be focusing on travel models. So I uh, thought I'd start out with just real quick, you know, what is big data? It's, you know, a term that's thrown around a lot. You know, big data is obviously used in a lot of other, um, you know, places used in sports. You know, if you're a baseball fan, you've probably heard about, you know, advanced analytics using big data. But today we're really here focusing on smartphones and modern vehicles that collect vast amounts of data, which can then be processed and potentially leveraged to offer insights into planning and travel model development projects. And I really just wanted to start off with like any data source, you know, passive data comes with its own sets of strengths and limitations and that those need to be understood in order to maximize the utility of the data and reduce any potential error bias. You know, this is still a sample of data. Uh, it's still largely, you know, comes with the passive data and needs to be imputed a lot of the information. The way I really like to look at it is it really just presents another tool in the toolbox to go along with a lot of the other sources that we're using, whether that be household travel surveys, traffic counts, other forms of surveys, you know, say vehicle intercept, in-person surveys, that there's really a lot of data sources out there. And I think a lot of what I'm going to talk about today applies to all data sources, but once again, just really focusing here on passive data or big data sources. And one thing that I always like to show at the beginning of these presentations is this figure here in kind of the bottom right where you see the, the purple circles and the kind of teal colored dots. I just like to kind of illustrate what this data looks like when it comes through. Um, the teal data is for the teal circles is actually what cellular data sources looked like back when I started working with them around the 2012 timeframe. And you can kind of see here, they, they really vary in size. They kind of seem to be all over the place. Whereas the teal dots were what the GPS based data sources look like. You can see a much finer resolution and really closely tied to roadway segments. And so uh, with that, I think it's kind of a, a good segue into just kind of at least my internal history with working with big data sources and and really just a key thing to understand is that, you know, this is a data space that's constantly changing. You know, as you can see here by the scale, the data has really only been around for about 10 years. Uh, I would say by comparison, I think, you know, travel demand models have been around since the 60s. So have had a lot of time to really evolve and um, become what they are today. Whereas, you know, relatively speaking, uh, it's quite a bit different in the big data space. And so I actually started working with the data back in the 2011 and 2012 timeframe. And back then it was largely the telco or cellular 
risk-based data. So essentially cellular providers were selling their data and allowing it to be analyzed and then sold for planning purposes. And there was a really great sample size with that, but it's not quite like it is in the movies where the police are able to triangulate your cell phone to you know, an individual room in a building that it really only offered a spatial resolution of about plus or minus two kilometers. So it was really good for understanding like city to city travel patterns, but really not for much more than that. Um, then came along this kind of bluish, light bluish color, which is GPS-based personal data. So this became, you know, uh, Garmin devices, cars that had GPS built into them. And one of the really great benefits, as you kind of saw on the last slide, is it had a really great spatial resolution. I believe it was in the 5 to 10 meter range. You could understand what roads they were taking. You could have a lot smaller zones but it was a much smaller sample size. And there were actually a lot of biases in the data that we discovered through some of our work that people who own these devices tended to be higher income. And so you were missing out on a very important part of the population, especially for transit planning. Um, so then came along location-based services when smartphones and smart apps kind of became more of the norm. And this kind of blended everything together. So now everything is built into the background of apps. And so you were actually able to get your devices to utilize uh, Wi-Fi in addition to the telco as well as the GPS. And so it provided really the best of both worlds because you were able to have a much better spatial resolution on average in the 20 to 30 meter range while still having a very big sample. And then I'll touch on this at the end of my presentation, but this dark blue here represents uh, connected vehicle data. And so due to some federal as, as well as state legislation, uh, we're starting to see a drop in uh, location-based services sources and this shift towards connected vehicle sources. And I'll explain some of the implications of that towards the end of my presentation. So as I mentioned, there, there's a lot of different data types and those have evolved over time. Uh, there's also what we like to refer to as a constellation of data vendors out there as well. And the question you might be asking yourself, and you know, you've probably had conversations with all of these providers that I have up here, you know, Replica, Weijo, Geotab, Streetlight, you know, which, which should you use? And, you know, I would largely say it depends. You know, on my previous slide, I talked about, you know, each data source having its, you know, own strengths and limitations. And I would say that the vendors do as well. I'll, data vendors do things a little bit differently. Uh, RSG even tried their hand at processing raw data sources, and we discovered that it was extremely difficult, very messy, required significant you know, infrastructure investments, cleaning, and quite frankly, a lot of assumptions to be made that a lot of these companies all have their own algorithms that are trying to determine when a trip starts and ends, and you know, it, it, they all do it a little bit differently. And so RSG gained a lot of insights through this process. And so what we, our approach now is to evaluate these vendors, to, to really work with them, and to recommend the best solutions for our clients without singling out one particular vendor as necessarily being you know, better or worse than another vendor. It's more about what are the strengths of each and how might they then fit into the actual question that you're answering. It could be a single vendor, a combination of vendor, or maybe you have a question that we're just not, that the data is just not quite there and ready to answer yet. And so I, I covered this just a little bit already, but you know, hoping that you know what you guys can take away from this is a little bit of what RSG has learned and the approach that RSG has developed throughout this process. And that's really first to just think about the existing data that you do have, that it's very important to understand that and leverage that, you know, what you've already made significant investments in when really trying to answer your questions or update your travel model or whatever it is you might be trying to do to evaluate and recommend data sources, not just assume that one might be better than another for a particular application. And then I really can't stress this enough, but the importance of combining data. And I don't just mean passive or, or big data providers here. I do mean, as I mentioned earlier as well, traffic counts, survey data, et cetera, that, you know, once again, I look at big data as another tool in the toolbox and something that has its own unique strengths and limitations, and that you really need to combine it with other data sets to minimize the limitations of each to make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. And so I've, over the last 10 or so years, I've talked with a lot of data vendors. And so on this slide, I really just want to share with you, you know, really what I've kind of learned from that. And really the first one is, um, you know, beware the oversell. And what I mean by this is that, you know, sometimes you're talking with sales representatives, sometimes you're talking with the engineering team, and depending on who you're talking to, they're going to have a different focus, and they either might not fully understand one aspect of another person's role, you know, sales might not fully understand the engineering side of things. And so sometimes you just need to be very careful about what they say that their data can do. And, you know, just really make sure that you're asking the right questions uh, to really understand if it really can. I touched on this a bit earlier, you know, big data, at least in my opinion, for from a usable perspective has maybe only been around for about five to 10 years. Um, I really 
can't also emphasize this enough that working with vendors who are very open about their data, uh, you know, the last thing you want to do is invest, you know, significant resources into data to find that you don't really understand, you know, what is kind of behind the scenes, so to speak. And then thinking about how to integrate that with your existing data. I've mentioned travel surveys a couple of times now. I'll, I'll have some specific examples of that on later slides, but they really have opposite limitations to one another. You know, as I mentioned earlier, passive data can be, especially with LBS and even moving into connected vehicles, can be an extremely large sample of data. However, a lot of the information we gather from that is through an algorithm and is imputed. And so that obviously is not user input and may not be entirely accurate. Whereas survey data is usually extremely detailed data directly from the sur you know the surveyee and they tend to understand and know what they did obviously there is underreporting issues in surveys and of course the survey sample response rates tend to be in the one to two percent range or even sometimes less than one percent so combining these can really reduce the limitations of one and and really make the whole greater than the sum of its parts um, I also want to make sure that everyone understands you know that you need to keep in mind that there is still significant time and effort when you purchase this data, that they've made leaps and bounds over the years in their online GUIs and how you're able to access the data, but it still does require a significant level of analysis and designing your data collection plan to, to really get at what you want. And then ask the tough questions. I touched on this under beware the oversell. And on my next slide, I'm just going to cover some of the questions over the years that I've asked. So one that's very important, given the very first slide about how many data sources are out there, you know, what's what's your data source? Are you using LBS data? Are you transitioning to connected vehicle data? What is the spatial resolution of your raw and process data? Uh, what is your sample rate and how do you measure that? Sample rate can be incredibly important. I mentioned previously the GPS data was only in the you know one to two percent of the population range, whereas cellular was significantly higher, as was LBS. That can really impact what the biases and limitations of your data is. How do you expand your data source? So a lot of data providers take a shot at this. Some do not, some do. Uh, I would say a majority do. Um, they try to utilize traffic counts or census population data to really expand their sample. Um, but at the end of the day, all of these are a sample of data, which is important to understand. Uh, how do you measure and account for biases? How do you validate your data? Are you out there utilizing traffic count data or another form of data to help expand, but also to validate? You know, If you're providing active mode, how are you getting counts from bike and ped to really validate that data? These are all very important things to understand before you set out to use this data on a particular project. Do you infer travel mode? This is a big one. Some data providers have provided you know, measurements of travel mode, even OD tables of active mode. And so understanding how they got to that is extremely important. And then especially with a lot of the legislation coming out around LBS data, protecting you know, people around hospitals, protecting children, how do you protect personal data? This is very important. Also really understanding at what level they're allowed to report data based off their sampling rates. Sometimes we've found that their sample rates are just so low that they actually don't meet some of the thresholds and actually aren't able to even provide data for certain applications because of these personal data protections that are in place. So with that, I'll quickly just go through some project examples, really trying to highlight the data source that I've used and the questions we helped answer. So uh, I worked with Danielle at NVTA on the Napa Valley Travel Behavior Study, We're utilizing streetlight LBS data for our second time around. And really a big part of this was just helping Napa understand travel patterns better. You know, there's a lot of visitors, but also a lot of in-commute as well as just a lot of, you know, resident travel in the county. And so trying to identify, you know, the biggest trip generators, OD tables, and also really try to understanding, you know, the distribution of trips by time of day. Napa is a little unique. A lot of their commuters actually leave very early to avoid congestion on State Route 37 and usually leave to come home around two or three o'clock, which is a little bit different time profile than a lot of other um, counties in the Bay Area. So understanding that is extremely important for you know, model development projects in Napa County. Um, I'm currently working on a, a Tampa Bay visitor survey augment using replica simulation data and another provider that's out there. And really what this is intended to do is to be a supplement to a visitor and worker more traditional, you know, household travel survey. And this data is going to serve as data for model calibration but it's also gonna really help them answer some policy related questions. You know, What new challenges have arisen as a result of COVID? What previous challenges may be lessening today? How have trends changed? And has anything been accelerated, dampened or, or even reversed? And to show an example of that, this is a travel behavior study update that I did for Sonoma County. And uh, we utilize Streetlight LBS for this. 
And Sonoma County just really wanted to help understand how their travel behavior changes, you know, how travel behaviors changed since COVID, but also where they should now be focusing infrastructure investment. And so as you can kind of see on the slide here, uh, a lot of work has recently been done over the past, say, five to 10 years on what's referred to as the Narrows, investing a lot of public funds. And what we found is that traffic was actually down about 25% overall, and a majority of that was going from, you know, the Santa Rosa or, or Sonoma County into San Francisco and um, Marin County. And we actually found that travel actually greatly increased in the north. And we were able to utilize them, uh, quite a few different types of data sources and actually came to find that these were essentially service workers, um, you know, taking jobs in Sonoma County to meet the demand for internal services related to people no longer commuting. So these were actually very linked to one another. So people were no longer commuting to San Francisco, they're working from home. So now when they need to grab lunch or run an errand at lunch, instead of doing it in San Francisco, they're actually doing it in Sonoma County. And so you have this greater need for infrastructure to support increased inflow of workers. Um, we also utilize Streetlight LBS data during our development of the Marin County model. And one of the big areas that we use this is really just to help calibrate and validate the OD and worker location models. What you can see here is some key origin destination pairs that we measured with mobility data. And then we compared that to what's in the model and actually went in and did some calibration of the model, uh, trip distribution patterns, or even the gravity models uh, to really try to get these flows right. Um, you can see here just, you know, some more kind of major commute flows, Sonoma County to Marin and to San Francisco. And so really using a secondary data source that, you know, household travel surveys can, can be kind of limiting in terms of that. And then really understanding how worker location choice varies by city. What you can see here is we were really trying to understand, you know, what are those variations and, and how can we measure them and really try to code that into the model so that we have an improved worker location choice model. Um, we also wanted to help calibrate our travel models for VMT and SB743. If you're in California, especially, this is probably right at the you know, top of your list of things to think about. So, you know, mobility data or big data providers can really help, especially with the transition to connected vehicles, understand how trip lengths vary. Um, by here, you can see how they vary by gateway into a county or even how they vary by city, that they can actually vary quite a bit and even by time of day. Um, and I'll bring back my, actually, this is the first round of the Napa Valley Travel Behavior Study where we actually utilize GPS data. And really one of the things during this study we were looking at is they were just about to widen Jamison Canyon as well as try to understand congestion along State Route 29 and we're evaluating whether to widen this. And so we were trying to understand the sources of congestion. And so we utilize GPS data and just shifting here a little bit, we were really concerned about data accuracy and verifying that accuracy. And we're trying to come up with a methodology to do that. And so what we did was we didn't just rely on the GPS data because we kind of, in, you know, kind of knew that there would be some limitations. And so we actually did a license plate capture and performed license plate matching as well as a vehicle intercept survey and an employer survey. So we actually combined all these sources together to really try to paint a picture. And we did actually discover and were able to actually pretty, you know, easily show that there were some biases towards uh, the data and that they were actually missing some of the workers that were coming in, likely because they couldn't afford, you know, some of these connected vehicles at the time or GPS in their vehicles at the time, because those vehicles tended to cost a little bit more. And one of the reasons I bring this up is I'm just hypothesizing that there'll be very similar biases when connected vehicle data starts being more used over LBS data, that connected vehicles have really only been in cars since 2018 and really only at a high percentage since 2019 or 2020. So if you're trying to study people that likely did not buy a car, a brand new car in 2019 or 2020 later, um, that you're probably going to be missing them from a connected vehicle data source. Um, utilizing traffic counts to understand sampling rates can be an extremely powerful tool as well. This is just showing an example of basically what the ratio is of, in this case, streetlight data um, of kind of observed samples at a location versus an actual daily traffic count. So this can really help you understand penetration rates and how those might vary around a particular study area. Um, I'll blow through this one really quickly because as I think I'm coming up on my time here. Um, basically, another thing to always make sure to do though is just, you know, apply some reasonableness checks to the data that, you know, uh, it can be very easy if you're, I'm actually analyzing a Costco, dis Costco distribution center. And so you can see here that this is the travel patterns, kind of a heat map, density map. So what are those dark cells? Do they make sense? And so here you can see, I just Google mapped where Costco stores were, and you can see those generally fall on top of those. Food distribution centers are another location that they go to, and then truck stops. And at the end of the day, I felt that the data actually looked pretty good just by doing these fairly simple checks. 
And I've touched on this a bit already as well. Um, validating to other sources of data is extremely important. You can utilize National Household Travel Survey, you know, Bay Area Travel Survey here in the Bay Area, ACS, even ITE trip generation. You could utilize, you know, say you cordon off a residential area just to make sure that the sampling looks right. Um, you can utilize a tool like RMOVE, which is a very robust, um, you know, survey engine. And my very last slide here is just, you know, connected vehicle data considerations, as I showed on one of my first slides, that there is this shift away from LBS sources. They're getting a lot smaller into connected vehicles and just helping you understand that, you know, this is going to shift the focus to autos um, and towards auto-oriented peoples. The questions are still out there that remain unanswered. For instance, how do we then capture those that don't have autos? Um, but it also comes with it a lot of really great opportunities, uh, potential for safety studies. What you can see over here on the right is, you know, harsh braking, cornering, um, travel speeds. These are all things that can be measured by the cars and then reported back and put into the data set. So I really see a lot of potential for upcoming safety studies, as well as electric vehicle planning studies. We can get a lot more information about the car, including is it an existing EV? And so we can actually isolate existing EV travel patterns and put that into our planning work. Uh, and so with that, I will uh, go ahead and stop and turn it back over to Lisa for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. And I think in the interest of time to make sure that we have plenty of time what we're going to do is um, move over to our MAG panelists, and I'm so glad to see that you are successfully able to join, and my apologies for the difficulties, um, but thank you for joining us today, um, and we'll have you go through your presentation, and then um, I see that folks are putting questions into the Q&A, which I appreciate so much, so keep doing that. I think I'm, I'm clicking answer live, which I think means we will talk about them after the presentations are concluded, um, so keep thinking keep putting those in there so we um, can get to them at the end. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to have a great and robust discussion. Um, and, um, and with that, I will um, hand it over to Wang and Pecha. Um, I think uh, you should be able to share your screen. And also, if you wouldn't mind, please give a, a short intro to who you are and um, your experiences as well. Thank you so much. And thank you, Kevin. And also, I, you're on mute, so you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, there you go. So first, Pesha, would you like to share the presentation since yes. we're going to do it jointly? Yes, I will move the screen for both of us. All right. Um, thanks for the Great. opportunity for um, for us to share. You know our experience of applying big data to Mac projects, and uh, I'll be uh, giving this presentation along with my colleague Pecha. My name is Wang Zhang. I'm the Transparent Data Program Manager at Mac. Uh, let's go to the next slides since we have really tight on the time. So just give you guys uh, some introduction of the Mac. If you're not familiar with us, you know we are an MPU at the Phoenix uh, Metro uh, Partisan Area in Arizona. Uh, accounting for you know 5.7 uh, you know model the population in our region across in basically two counties Maricopa County and uh, Pinal counties and also account for two uh, almost three thirds of the uh, of the jobs in the state of Arizona. So let's go to the next slide. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so today we are going to um, give you. It's good. Yeah. So um, I'll be first to give you guys some introduction of how Mac has been using connected vehicle data by recently in, you know, bringing this new data source into different kind of analysis and the planning and the modeling exercise, and followed by a page presentation focusing on the uh, you know uh, location based data application to our modeling work here. Uh, first of all, let me talk about you know how the data connection practice has evolved in the last 20, 30 years. Um, mainly uh, regarding the uh, travel time and speed data, destination, those type of the mobility data sets. The first the two uh, parts in the left hand of the window, you know, it's uh, you know, so agency has to do it either manually or semi-automatically. Uh, but that's uh, you know, um, effort you have to spend uh, to connect the data, travel time and uh, speed data, for example. Until we get to last, you know, 10, 12 years, you know, we're able to sit in the office to acquire those kind of third party speed data uh, from certain companies that uh, the data has been connected by, you know, the fleets 
or you know personal GPS devices uh, and nowadays uh, in your smartphones. So we're able to you know not actually spending a dime to connect the data, but uh, directly purchase those commercialized uh, you know available type of the mobility data for our you know uh, planning and model use. And uh, you know Mac has been you know testing water in the last couple of days, trying to get to the next phase, which is a connected vehicle data, which we see. Uh, lots of the you know really values inside of that. So I talk a little bit more about the connected vehicle data and its application uh, at Mac. So let's go to the next slide. So PJ, could you play the video on the bottom, please? Thank you very much. So the we have been acquiring this uh, connected vehicle data for the last three years, as you may understand. Uh, as Kevin alluded, uh, you know the data is very new, uh, and the data we acquire is actually from 2015 and newer. And there's so many different sensors uh, can potentially, potentially generate all kinds of the data sets from the connected vehicles, such as you know, your speed, uh, your you know, location, your timestamp. And more important than that, you can also uh, obtain the information such as your CPU buckling status, your windshield wiper status, even your headlights, turning lights status like that. So there's all kinds of different data can be potentially leveraged uh, through the connected vehicles, uh, you know, technologies. But the main thing I want to talk about that is uh, movement movement data, which is just the position, speed, and heading directions directly coming from the connected vehicle data in every three seconds. So three years ago, when we were exposed to this data, we feel like, hey, there's lots of the great potential in that. Uh, right across the board, we feel like uh, we can apply that to OD, you know, studies and uh, past choices. Uh, deceleration, acceleration information is really useful to us. And uh, more importantly, we feel like the, at the intersection measurements, you know, we can potentially use this data to see if we can replace the floating car, uh, you know, method to give us a control delay, arrive on green, a speed failure, et cetera, et cetera, those intersection uh, uh, matrix. So like I said, you know, the data we got is, does not cover everything we want uh, the data to come from. It's a fairly new, 2015 and newer. It only covers passenger cars. We need to understand that. Sedan SUV pickups does not have any medium truck, does not have any heavy trucks. And uh, it also only comes from certain OEMs. Uh, it does not give you a sense of the, you know, uh, data feeds from all kinds of, uh, you know, car brands that's running on the road. Penetration rates varies by region, uh, but in our region, our own calculation indicates it's about the four to six percent. And um, Many of you are aware of the, this main company has been providing connective vehicle data is uh, experiencing some uh, serious hiccups. And uh, so the, the, uh, the near future of the data availability is still unclear, uh, even though the data is being generated 365. And we're hoping, you know, we can, you know, they can find a solution moving forward and where some new player will get into this market to continue to provide the connective vehicle data. So that kind of say a little bit about the, you know, the, the stability issues you need to consider when you try to bring in connected vehicle data or any new emerging data sets. That's something you have to keep in mind. Let's go to the next slide. Can we play this? So this is just a very straightforward comparison of the floating com you know, measure on the left versus connected vehicle data's trajectory on the right. So these two, uh, um, you know, videos are generated at the same time and we used to run, you know, floating car just to help us to understand the corridor performance measurements or intersections measurements, stuff like that. And now you can see there's a way more samples potentially can be provided through connected vehicle data. And uh, the cost is almost the same. I'm talking about applying, you know, floating car, exercise on few corridors, so once or twice, you know, per day versus, uh, you know, one week or a couple of weeks the subscription to the same data, which covers all the corridors you want to analyze in our region, for example, you know, 5.7 million populations. So I just want to give you some uh, indication of how much more samples you can potentially get when you try to leverage connected vehicle data for a table management type of exercise. Let's go to the next slide. And obviously, you know, this is work uh, we started fully in, uh, in the house. And, uh, you know, that's about three years ago. When we, Like I said, when we look at the data, we feel like uh, uh, the biggest value in you know, applying connected vehicle data is towards uh, arterial management. So we're able to perform this kind of proof of concept type of access in-house just to see what kind of measurements we can crank out 
uh, utilizing CVD data, such as uh, label service, uh, you know, uh, control delay by turning movement, uh, speed fear, I already mentioned that, et cetera, et cetera. There's also a very strong correlation between the turning movement ratio from the sample. As we understand, CVD data does not give you 100% of universe, it's just a sample. But there is a very strong correlation between this, uh, um, you know, CVD based uh, um, turning movement ratio and actual turning movement counts. Let's go to the next slides. So keep that in mind, we feel like, uh, you know, we need to move forward with uh, applying CVD data uh, more seriously to the arterial management. Uh, considering our region, uh, there's, uh, you know, more than half of the VMT being carried by our great arterial systems. We definitely need to do something about it to understand it better. Uh, we understand the value of the CVD as compared to the floating car. There's, uh, you know, great, uh, you know, cost benefit, uh, you know, factors we need to consider. Um, and uh, and the, the main thing we think is, uh, you know, to apply the data to uh, arterial management at the intersection or corridor level. So in this year, as we speak, we're still piloting uh, this signal analytics, of, uh, you know, product developed by INRIX. Uh, you know, we give access to our member agencies, which are all the cities here, operation folks are using uh, this signal analytics based on the CVD data to help with their daily, you know, um, work, uh, either at intersection or at a corridor to help them with, uh, you know, monitoring their intersections performance, as well as uh, potentially helping uh, to fine tune their signal timing plan to further improve the mobility. Let's go to the next slide. And other usage or other applications as this data is so um, versatile, I wanna uh, briefly touch on that. Uh, you know, for example, we also use CVD data to help us understand the bottlenecks on the freeways. It will give you a very precise location and the measurements of the, how the queue is being formed up and discharged and uh, you can potentially select the uh, perform select link analysis to understand the market of particular freeway segments where it could be heavily congested. Keep in mind it's based on the four to six percent of the orange destination and the trend analysis. We found that our permanent counters trend uh, since COVID looks very, very similar to the VMT to the number of the you know uh, uh, journeys uh, produced uh, by the CVD database. So we continue to look into that. And uh, we also use this data set because uh, it's every three seconds cover every potential sequence you wanna look at. Uh, we can use this data sets to benchmark other mobility data sets when we have questions on them. Um, and, uh, you know, modeling uh, applications, either it's a microscopic or, or, or a microscopic models, uh, you will be able to, you know, apply that to um, CVD data to that, but, you know, let's not to talk about it too much for today, just, uh, you know, a quick summary. Um, event data, I already mentioned that, uh, you know, the main thing we have been doing is um, is on the movement data side, but uh, as long as data becomes available as in the future, I think we also want to look in, into the event data, look at the harsh breaks, uh, look at the correlation between the harsh break and the congestion, and look at the correlation between harsh break zones and, uh, you know, potential safety, uh, you know, concerned areas, stuff like that. Let's go to the next slide. So that's the end of my presentation. I will just give it to my colleague Petra to for her to continue. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll definitely address your question at the end. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Petra Maneva. I'm a travel demand modeler and a GS professional. So I will talk about how we use data from location-based services, or so LBS data, to uh, for two projects. One is we calibrated our weekend activity-based model using uh, the weekday model plus big data, LBS data. And also we used LBS data to model uh, the travel patterns of seasonal residents, people who live in the Phoenix metro only during the winter. And we also model uh, the movements of our visitors. All together, seasonal and transient visitors account for the 10 percent of people who are um, on the roads in our area so very briefly i hope um, it's not a too much of a repetition so what is lbs data the vendors collect data from cell phones and from mobile apps process package and sell they determine uh, there are three purposes in the lbs data so um analyzing the usual nighttime location of the cell phone owners or app users 
um, the vendors can figure out their home location. Also, they determine the usual weekday location, which is either work, um, work or, or school location. And every other place the cell phone owner might be or might go to would be categorized as other location. So we have three purposes, home, work, school, and other. Now, um, Kevin touched on the importance of sample size for this data. It varies by region, by provider, and so on. So you have to consider, to the extent you can figure this out, the, cell, um, the uh, size of the sample. Now, the sample, everything being equal, it, you have a better coverage in the urban core. Sample gets smaller as you go out to the suburbs and in the rural area, outside the residential area, it can be pretty thin, which means that it's hard to get LBS data for a small, uh, small geography. And small geographies are also not provided because of... Uh, um, of the desire to protect the privacy of the people whose uh, movements are being tracked. So uh, the off-the-shelf LBS data is sold uh, using census geography. So you either buy movements or trips between block groups or uh, trips between tracts and other uh, census geographies, but travel demand models all models, not just ours. Usually we model between movements between pairs of traffic analysis zones or TASs. So you have to, um, if you buy data, uh, census-based data, you need to process it and you need to go from flows between two census uh, geographies to flows between pairs of uh, TEZs. And for our project, um, using LBS data to um, to model weekend travel, uh, we performed area-based apportionment. There is one more way to do apportionment, but either way, it's a GIS procedure. And I'm showing here an extreme example um, because census geographies are delineated considering population and population only. They ignore employment, ignore um, uh, venues of large special events. And so the boundaries, there is a many-to-many -many relationship between the TZ boundaries, which consider population employment, school enrollment in event, uh, venues, of large venues of special events, and the census boundaries only consider population. So here you can see uh, the large, the large a polygon with thick purple lines. This is a single block group that covers uh, the largest airport in Phoenix Metro plus all the surrounding businesses, offices, and warehouses. So we have, we buy, if we look at uh, trips originating from that area, from the airport area, there's one single census block group in the data that you would buy from any vendor. But in our uh, model, we have 10 um, TZs. And so if you look at the table, uh, you can see how we need to, we just disaggregate, break down the flaws originating uh, from the census block group into, we split it in 10 different subflows. And so here uh, you can see that 59.1% of the traffic starting in this enormous block group is assigned to this TZ. 11.1% is assigned to this TZ, and 9% is assigned to TZ 1854, and so forth. This needs to this needs to be done for all block groups, and also the same uh, the same process. Um, apportionment of flows has to happen at the destination end. So that's a step um, that you have to consider when we buy LBS data, converting the flows from pairs of census geographies using GIS procedures automatic that can be automated uh, to get to the point to having flows between pairs of uh, traffic analysis zones. So we use AirSage data. Uh, we constantly keep an eye on the market and we interview multiple LBS providers here, we, we pick them for a few reasons. One being when we compare, very high level comparison of uh, 
aggregate trips by purpose, ASH versus um, numbers we had from extensive literature review, because they came very close, their share of work and school trips was very, as part of the overall trips was close to what we expected from literature review. And this is uh, one important reason we picked this provider for, uh, for our project. So, uh, so we went, we have a weekday activity-based model and we did calibration using five different uh, data sets. We calibrated it to use it to um, make a, a weekend model from it. And you can see that uh, two of the five calibration targets came from LBS data. Uh, we uh, constructed uh, trip departure profiles into one hour bins from the LBS data. And also we used um, OG person trip person uh, trips distribution is uh, two very important calibration targets. So this, uh, these graphs show uh, how we calibrate. Uh, so we have um, uh, trips going from work or school to home um, grouped uh, in one hour departure time bins. And we calibrate these trips going from work or school going home on the left and on the right, these are again a number of departures, but by one hour bins. And these are trips going from work or school to a, another non home based location. So the targets are derived, these are profiles derived from LPS data, and they are shown in black. And the red lines show uh, the model output. So we feel like we um, did a pretty good match to our target. And this shows. Uh, calibration by uh, OD distribution. So we grouped our um, TEZs into 240 bigger zones or bigger districts, and we calculate uh, attractions at, and trips between these districts. So on the left, this is how it looked before calibration to OD pairs, to the right uh, after calibration. So you can see on the right side, uh, we compare uh, total trips attracted to a zone, and again, we have 240 zones for that purpose, versus uh, total trips calculated from the AirSage data, which is LBS data, versus total uh, attractions in our model output. So we um, achieved a decent match to the audit targets, which were uh, constructed, which were set from uh, look and data from location-based services. Um, another application for LBS data was to model on um, the travel of visitors to the region. And this is this data is bought at the level of census tract. So here you can see it's just an overview how it looks. These are uh, trips ending at, um, at each census tract. The darker the orange, the more um, visitors go there, and you, if you spot the the red the red polygon in the center, that's the largest airport. So naturally, there'll be a lot of trips ending there, as well as originating there. So how we use LBS data to model visitors? Uh, so we got the data, as I said, at the sensor geography of tracts. We enrich this data with land use data and employment data by industry, we basically enriched it with every possible um, data that could uh, be a potential explanatory variable. And then we ran a regression analysis and we identified few uh, land use and employment variables that explained the movement of uh, the visitors. And so that was implemented, this, um, regression was uh, implemented in our model. And this was done twice, once for visitors and another one for seasonal residents. Because LBS providers can very easily detect the home location and usual daytime location of uh, the uh, app users or cell phone users, it is very easy if you want to distinguish between permanent resident versus seasonal residents versus visitors, it is very easy to uh, basically 
as a, by that data by uh, type of uh, population segment and then use it for, for modeling of these, we call them special populations, the visitors and the seasonal residents. And that was my last slide and um, I'll pass it on to Lisa and we answer questions in, um, in the order she, she suggests. Thank you, Wang, and thank you, Petya, so much for your presentation. Um, and we ran a little long, I, uh, so my apologies. We, we do have uh, 12 minutes for discussion and questions. And um, since we have a number of questions in the Q&A, um, which I believe everyone can see, um, I, I have um, asked folks, um, the panelists, that they can, they, if they're willing to type out the answers to some of them, then that would be great. Um, but some of the ones that I marked earlier as, as going to discussion, we can get to them now. So, and also, I'm, I'm also probably going to prefer some that I have some interest in too, because we're running out of time. Um, so um, the first one, and also feel free to raise your hand if you want to sort of chime into the discussion. I, I realize that this is a little bit of a webinar limitation. It would have been nice to just open mics for discussion. Um, so if you have something to contribute to the current discussion, feel free to raise your hand and we'll see if that works. Um, so the first one is from James Lee um, for Kevin about data constantly changing. And in slide three, um, he says that they were used for long range forecasts. I'm assuming he's talking about you use them for long range forecasts. And he said he was wondering if you could share your thoughts, experiences on comparisons with versions of data over time, which I think is a really interesting question, especially given that you know, your street light graphic about how the data sources are changing over time. So presumably the contents of that data are changing over time. And, you know, how do you handle situations like that? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. And maybe I'll just address the first part first. You know, we, we do typically take that data and use it to say, calibrate and validate a base year model to improve that for forecasting purposes. Rarely um, do we apply any form of like regression or anything like that to try to do forecasting straight off the data. I just my personal opinion, I wouldn't recommend going that route. I would recommend it more to inform existing models or tools, but that that's just my opinion. Um, you know, getting into thoughts of comparing data over time. Honestly, like I've been told by pretty much all the data providers not really to do that, that their sources vary greatly over time. I remember at one point, and I'm gonna to try to avoid using specific vendor names in this, but I remember one vendor telling me that their sample size literally tripled like all of a sudden and that they wouldn't mm -hmm. actually recommend comparing back to data that you got from them a year ago, two years ago, however long ago it might've been. And that presents a pretty unique problem that it basically means you kind of need to evaluate the data every time. They're also constantly improving their algorithm that, you know, the algorithm changes a lot as well. And they may have found something that was quite frankly, potentially wrong. You know, we all find bugs or fixes, things that need to be fixed in our models and that might impact things as well. But, you know, I really think the sample rates, penetration rates is, is probably the biggest one. You know, when their sample triples and they're not really able to tell you exactly who all of their providers, you know, their vendors are, because I think this is another important thing that I, I may have forgotten to mention. They're not always allowed to tell you where all their data comes from. And so that can present a lot of challenges uh, moving forward. Um, and then Lisa, just James had a second one that I also thought yes. was, was, was really great. And I really want to be extremely clear about this because quite frankly, I don't want to get myself into trouble, but I want to be clear that measuring biases in this data is extremely difficult. And I, I want to be clear, I have not actually measured any bias in connected vehicle data because I have not actually received any connected vehicle data yet where my hypothetical biases were coming in is from a lot of research that I did into what is a connected vehicle, how long have they been around? And it's just my hypothesis that if they've really only been, you know, selling since 2019, is a low income person, say you're doing a transit study, you know, is a non-auto owner, is a low income person going to be in that data set? And my hypothesis is no. And so if you're utilizing that data for a transit, connected vehicle data for a transit study, I am personally worried that you'll be completely missing the group that you're really trying to go after. That being said, I haven't studied it, so I don't know. Right. Um, and then I think a follow on that's kind of related to the original um, question about sources um, is Kara's question about the slide three, and maybe we should look at that really quickly if that's easy to yeah. share. Let me share my screen. Uh, oh, oh, I think I can stop. Yeah. 
There cool. we go. Cool. Awesome. Because I was wondering that too, and we've had some internal discussions for yeah. <laughs> the replacement of, you know, what we're seeing in terms of the LBS data sort of really shrinking. And I'm not sure. I I was like, we were actually discussing what the darker shades of green are and what those mean because we're not <laughs> totally sure, or what the y-axis means. That's what um, question like Kara was asking what the y-axis means. Um, and she also had some questions about um, uh, why RITIS RITIS INRIX wasn't showing in the set of vendors. Although I think the set of vendors that you showed were just vendors that you maybe personally ex had an experience or were talking about in this and not, not necessarily the full constellation of Correct. data vendors. Okay. Correct. Yeah, so as a clarification, these are the ones that I personally have spent a good amount of time working with. And once again, I, I don't want to name names here just because I don't want to get myself into potential, um, you know, trouble by revealing people's contracts. But I know for pretty much a fact that at least two, or possibly at least actually three of the vendors in that list also sell their data to another vendor or possibly two in that list. So I also wanted to make that very clear to this group that you can get data directly from one vendor or that vendor also sells their data to other vendors. And the difference will be, you know, what did they purchase as well as which algorithm. So they all essentially have algorithms. I also mentioned earlier that some of them do not choose to not try to expand that data set. And, you know, oh, and actually I'm on the perfect slide. RSG, um, you know, took a try at that and found it also extremely difficult to understand biases, penetration rates, and to expand that data and found that, as I'm sure they, the data vendors are finding as well, that it's just an extremely difficult process. And so um, tying that then back to the, oops, sorry, the answer to the more specific question about the y-axis. So if you had asked me to draw this chart, I would have drawn it completely differently. Um, this is something that's on Streetlight's website and, and RSG kind of kind of took it and wanted to, you know, basically illustrate it. And, and, you know, so we wanted to give Streetlight credit that they're the ones that developed this. Um, so my understanding is, is that right around this period where they show LBS data going up, that it should be a much, much steeper curve. I remember being told by uh, Streetlight in particular at one point that their sample size like tripled. And so- And that was, you're talking about like in the early days of LBS. Yeah. Correct. Okay, more, 2017 more or period. 20, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. And so what these different colors then are when a new provider comes along. And so you can see here that they don't really call out what the, and it's possible they do on their one on their website. I think we simplified it a little bit, but I think this is another important thing to understand as well that, you know, new LBS data providers come along all the time. And, and once again, I want to not name names here and not get myself into trouble, but there are, you know, there's literal documentation out there of vendors quite literally making up data and selling, you know, non factual data. And that is what is actually leading to some of this federal, you know, restrictions on LBS data. So essentially, there's a lot of providers out there. I've probably talked with not even exaggerating at least 20 providers over the years, possibly probably more, actually. And, you know, a lot of them say they have data. And when kind of asking for a sample of data, a lot of them would never provide it. And when some would provide it, it was nonsensical, and it didn't make sense. And it could have been made up. I, I obviously didn't know, um, but we then chose not to work, you know, not, not to purchase any more data from that vendor. So I, so basically to more directly answer the question, yeah, apologies. The y-axis isn't really to scale. I would have drawn it very differently. I think this is just meant to give kind of a general representation of kind of how it's changed over time. Got it. Um, and then I think a super interesting slide is the one with the questions. Can we go to that one? Absolutely. And there were some, uh, there was a, Brian Lee had asked about this. Um, he, he notes at least some of these questions point towards quantitative answers. Are there industry standards in terms of how big data is measured to help um, under, you know, to help ensure apples to apples comparisons and are there recommendations of thresholds and ranges for different applications? And I will note that there were also some questions um, that discussed this in the chat that um, in terms of suggestions from other people, um, which are from Josh Roll. So I think uh, there's a set of guidelines to consider when purchasing vehicle volume um, estimates. But anyway, I think this is, this is a great slide for discussion for 
um, all of the panelists, because I think, you know, I'm like, I'm wondering, are there some of these questions that, you know, we don't necessarily get answers to or, and how do we handle when those answers are not satisfactory? Is there anything we can do? Because we've just certainly had situations where, um, you know, where we ask, what are your data sources? And the answers can be a little bit hard to understand or they're proprietary. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so I think at a high level, um, I think the answer is pretty much a no in terms of is, is there standard recommendations. You know, I, I haven't seen anything. And for instance, you know, the California RTP guidelines where, or FHWA, you know, regarding ma model validation criteria, I personally have not come across anything like this. Um, and to your point too, Lisa, there's a lot of these questions that they either are contractually not allowed to answer or will, you know, maybe actually honestly don't even know the answer. You know, for instance, asking, you know, if you're say you're Napa County, I'll just use my Napa as an example, you know, what is your sample rate within Napa County? It's very likely they haven't even looked at that. You know, they probably hmm. look at it from the perspective of, you know, we think we capture 20 to 30 percent of you know, devices with our LBS sample source, you know, that might be as, as far as they go. And so that's where questions like, you know, how do you expand your data source? How do you validate your data source, you know, really come into play. And I just wanted to touch on one slide because I think, it, I think it was in this comment or possibly one of the other ones about, you know, presenting a false sense of precision with, you know, number of decimal places and things like that. I couldn't agree more. And so you got to be, and apologies, I don't know why I'm having a hard time finding it. So you'll see here that I used low estimate and high estimate. So we got a number, you know, right here in the middle. And I think we applied a plus or minus 20%. You know, where I got that plus or minus 20%, it just kind of a gut feel, quite frankly, completely made up. But you know, I've been asked that question before by a lot of clients and, and in other presentations I've made, you know, can you put a plus or minus percentage on all of your metrics? And, and I would say I can do my best, but it's it's really just a feel and a guess without, you know, stricter guidelines and criteria being out there. So my client at the time was, was Derek McGill at TAM. He didn't feel comfortable, you know, reporting a single number from the big data source. Mm -hmm. So essentially what this represents is a plus or minus 20, and apologies, it might be 15%, but it's a plus or minus 15 or 20%. And then basically, are we within that range? And he was even okay with not being in that range for some of the flows, because he knows mm -hmm. the county better than I do. And he actually said he actually thought that number and that number actually made more sense. And so he was okay with not being in line with the data. Great, thank you for that. And and I wanna just make sure, um, Petcha and Wang, if you have any thoughts, especially on like the, the question list was something that we had discussed previously is having um, value in terms of both um, sort of, I think consolidating as an industry um, around some of these questions and trying to work together, I think, to, um, to be able to understand like what are what are reasonable answers and what kind of detail are we looking for and how do we handle the situation where we don't we aren't able to get answers to these questions i i think what kevin just mentioned pretty much uh, you know has uh, covered what i want to you know deliver uh, basically i think uh, you know Agencies needs to have um, open minded first uh, to embrace the new technology and new data set. That's for sure. But also ask lots of questions. And the second, I think agencies needs to develop their own expertise in dealing with a new emerging data set. Have, you know, continue to train your staff, expose your staff. Uh, you know, more frequently participate in the, the peer exchange like what we're doing right now. Uh, instead of you know tackling a particular problem by yourself, you know, try to work uh, collectively, you know, as a group, uh, you know, all the agencies, you know, work together uh, towards, uh, you know, achieving certain goals. Uh, I mean, I'm optimistic, uh, you know, to the to the big data concept in general, understanding, you know, the potential bias or, you know, the dangerous applying some, you know, low sample uh, data uh, to some really uh, big decision making process. So we need to definitely understand that. But that doesn't overweight, in my opinion, of the potential values you get, you can get, you know, from all type of the new data sets. So kind of in general, that's what I would like to add to what uh, Kevin has already mentioned. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to add one little thing. I think you've phrased it extremely well, um, that I think there's just a lot of potential here to quite frankly, get data that we were, you know, never really able to get before, you know, working with this data in wine country, 
that's why, you know, Danielle Schmidt at MBTA, I think originally reached out to me is she was just really struggling to find data that could go into her, you know, CTP and, uh, you know, or other counties that do a CMP, um, you know, some of the questions and policy related questions that they were being asked, there just wasn't a good data source, you know, out there for the data. And so is, is she wanted to le try to leverage some of these new technologies to help answer those. And in all of my reports at the end, I put a section usually in an appendix on limitations of the data. So in my opinion, you know, as long as you're being very clear about your methodology and documenting the known limitations that, you know, it, it, it's, it's something that can be built on and, and really still help people, even if we know there's biases and, and limitations. Yeah, and I also want to briefly touch on this, uh, you know, because I think uh, Shui Song Simon just asked a similar question regarding the overall the ballpark number of the of the data cost or acquisition or including the data processing analysis. I think uh, for agencies to jump onto a new uh, generation of the data sets, uh, first of all, we'll definitely saw the value, you know, of the utilizing the data to conduct some new analysis to help us know something we do not know before. That's for sure. That's the reason we're uh, going forward with that. Uh, secondly, I think uh, there may be the cost savings or may not be. Uh, I think in general, data becomes cheaper, uh, at least uh, in the sense of you pay the same you know, bucks for the uh, you know, for more amount of the data. That's for sure. However, as Jesu mentioned, you know, uh, in the big data errors, uh, there's also the burden comes with the data you just acquire or subscribe or purchase, whatever, uh, in, in terms of data processing and uh, analytics. So overall, you add all those costs together, it may not save you too much uh, as compared to the older generation of the technologies, but it helps you to learn your system better, helps you to find your system problems that you couldn't find utilizing the old fashioned of the data sets. I think that's more likely the values we could potentially get from leveraging the big data. So. And also I would like to point out that specifically for travel demand modeling, it is a very important and helpful auxiliary source. It's, you cannot replace a household travel survey yet with big data. What you can do is if you like, if you have uh, from the survey, you have data for mostly for weekdays and the model is estimated with survey for the weekdays, then you can use big data uh, for weekend model, or if you have, because you survey permanent residents, you can, uh, and for us, like seasonal and trans and visitors are like 10% of the population. So if you have, um, you can use data to uh, purchase big data to understand like visitors, if you have a survey on the permanent residents. So it, it works well in conjunction with um, at this point, household travel survey. It's not a substitute, but you can fill in the gaps. And like, if you have a survey from 2016 and you can't afford to right now do a new one, then you can buy from the same vendor, uh, you can buy 2016 data and current data. And by comparing, um, comparing the changes over time between if for the same geographies, in the same area, you can potentially update, uh, like recalibrate the model with current big date. Um, Although I would, but, I, but it I would is say to Kevin's point, yeah, it yeah, is to Kevin's story. point earlier about not comparing yeah. data from different snapshots in time. That also seems um, like something that we should be careful of, depending yeah. on how the data sources change. Of course, it does depend on. I wouldn't say you can do this this with any vendor, but. But again, uh, somebody who has been uh, pretty forthcoming about their limitations and people who when faced with questions uh, from us, go ahead and change, uh, like update or address our issues. So, and I don't want to endorse particular people, but I could do that. I would do a trend analysis uh, with particular vendors and the geography cannot be very small on that. Um, but a very um, kind of um, ballpark measure, if uh, when you compare, uh, you have to have a minimum 15,000 people in a district. Um, so you cannot go to small geography. You have to be groups of census tracts or group of thesis. So roughly very ballpark, if you go, it's difficult to have reliability if you go under 15,000 people in a district, if you're doing district level validations or whatever district level, that's my experience. 
Uh, so I can't say that no data vendor is good enough for trend analysis, but that it can be done if you really, really do due diligence. Great. And I know we're we're over time, so I want to um, respect people's time. Does anybody have any closing, closing, closing thoughts? Sorry. But otherwise, my closing thought is that there's clearly a lot of um, interesting topics to discuss, and I feel like we only touch the tip of the iceberg here. Um, and so um, with that, if anybody has any, no pressure though, because you've already given a number of closing thoughts, but if you have any others, um, here's your moment and otherwise we'll close it, close it down. And thank you so much for all of our panelists for joining us today and all of our attendees as well. And um, we will, you know, use this as our stepping stone as into, um, we're, we're planning to do more uh, learning sessions, um, more Zephyr learning sessions this year. So this is just the, the first one. Any other thoughts? I, I think I would just like to close with, you know, I, I've been working in the data for a really long time now and seen it evolve quite a bit. And I had to try to condense literally, I think, 10 years of knowledge into so these slides. And then actually Lisa yes. asked me to change a few things at the last minute. So I just want to say my my contact information, I think, is on the website and at the bottom. And, yes. you know, feel free wherever. I, you see, I even have extra slides that Lisa had me uh, <laughs> had me move down to the bottom. There it is. There's my contact info. So, yeah, I would be happy to chat with anyone please reach out to me email is probably the best and we can set something up would love to chat fantastic and actually i can i can make sure emails are posted to the event um site on on the zephyr website i don't think i did that but i can do that awesome thank you so much okay well then we'll wrap it up there thank you so much to our panelists thanks again to everybody who joined us today and um to be continued Great. have thanks a good for one. this opportunity thank you yeah, thank you Bye, thank everyone. you